Hi, it's Dr. Adam. Let's take molecular orbital theory beyond the diatomic and look at larger molecules. The two-dimensional system that we have been using to obtain molecular orbital diagrams has been useful and robust for diatomics, but what about larger molecules? Thankfully, there is a formalized procedure that can allow us to determine the group molecular orbitals for more complex molecules such as triatomics. This procedure relies on understanding of group theory and symmetry. This formalized procedure has the following steps. First, determine the molecule's point group. If the molecule is linear, simplify the symmetry by using D2H or C2V rather than D infinity H or C infinity V, which still capture the character of the orbitals. For reference, the Cartesian axes are assigned to the molecule with Z being the principal axis. Any outer atoms, such as the hydrogen in water, are assumed to have their Y axis pointing towards the central atom. Setting of these axes is arbitrary and won't bias the problem. Then find the reducible representations for all the atomic orbitals of the outer group atoms in the usual way. The next step is to reduce these to irreducible representations to provide the symmetry of the group orbitals or the symmetry adapted linear combinations. Then find the atomic orbitals on the central atom with the same symmetry as the sulks. And finally combine the group orbitals with the central at atom atomic orbitals with the same symmetry and similar energy to form the molecular orbital diagram. For simple linear molecules, the full procedure is often not necessary and the problem can be solved by inspection. For linear H3+, the simplest triatomic, there are only S orbitals to combine. The next step is to turn the linear H3+, into two components, the central H+, and the outer group atoms. The atomic orbitals for the group of outer atoms form the group orbitals. There are only two possible combinations, either in phase or out of phase. For the central atom, the choice is one and is arbitrary. In phase or out of phase, it does not matter. The group orbitals are too far apart from each other to interact with each other. The symmetry labels can then be applied to our atomic orbitals. Gerada for symmetric to inversion and ungerada for asymmetric to inversion. This is important because only groups with the same symmetry and similar energies can interact with each other. When combining the inner and outer parts of the molecular orbital diagram, first draw the atomic orbitals and fill in the electrons. Next, draw the sigma bonding and antibonding molecular orbitals from the atomic orbitals of the same symmetry. The other group orbital is ungerata and thus unable to form a molecular orbital with the atomic orbital of the central atom. This causes it to become a non-bonding orbital. Finally, the electrons are filled into the correct molecular orbitals, with the result being a 3-center, 2-electron bond, as the electrons are delocalized over the three atoms. A common theme of molecular orbital theory is that electrons can be delocalized over many centers. The next step in complexity is to add p-orbitals. A good example of this is the bifluoride ion, as there are now two p-orbitals of the fluorine outer atoms to be considered. Remember to use the D to H point group for simplicity rather than the D infinity H point group, and the Z axis is kept as the bond axis. Much like for H3+, the bifluoride ion can be split into two groups, one for the central atom and the other for the outer atoms. For hydrogen, there is still only the 1s orbital, but for the outer fluorine there are the 2s and 2p orbitals, giving four valence orbitals for each fluorine. By inspection, the combinations of the orbitals for the outer group can be determined. For the 2s orbitals. They provide sigma interactions and approach along the z-axis, either in phase or out of phase with each other. The irreducible representations for these group orbitals are then listed to either side. These can be generated easily using the character tables. AG is the fully symmetric representation and B is the asymmetric representation. The 2pz orbital also gives sigma type interactions, with the difference being totally symmetric and having the AG representation and the sum being asymmetric with the B1u representation. For the 2px and y orbitals, they can either be in phase or out of phase along with their irreducible representations. The symmetry labels come from the D2h character table. We then consider how each of these group orbital configurations transform under each symmetry operation. Looking at the easiest, the difference of the two pz orbitals, and consider each of the symmetry operations. It stays the same under each of them. 
remember that the molecular axes are defined opposite with z being the internuclear axis. It is quite easy to obtain the AG representation, so a harder one would be the difference in the two S orbitals. To obtain the B1U representation under E and C2 rotation in the Z axis, it is unchanged, but on rotation along the X and Y axis, there is a change giving minus one. Inversion and reflection in the XY plane also causes a change giving a minus one number. Reflections in the Z axis, both XZ and YZ, cause no change, resulting in plus one values, giving the B1U representation. As our central atom has AG symmetry, only the 2PZ and 2S orbitals have the correct symmetry to interact with the central atom. To determine which of the two fluorine atomic orbitals with AG symmetry will overlap with the hydrogen 1S orbital, we need to consult the orbital energies. The 2S fluorine orbitals are too low in energy to overlap effectively, so the molecular orbital will be formed between the fluorine 2P groups and the hydrogen 1S. As before, the 1s of hydrogen, the central atom, is on the left, with the group orbitals of the two fluorines on the right. Whilst the fluorine outer groups have two group orbitals with the same symmetry as the hydrogen atom, only one of these, that originating from the 2pz group atomic orbitals, are close enough in energy to interact properly. The hydrogen atom can only contribute one orbital, and so these two having the same symmetry and similar energies form the bonding and antibonding sigma orbitals of bifluoride. The remaining fluorine group orbitals are non-bonding. This gives us a three-center, two-electron bond. This gives a fractional picture of bonding due to electron delocalization quite different from the Lewis dot structure. So far the systems we have considered have had at least one of the species containing only S valence electrons. But now, with the carbon dioxide, all of the atoms have S and P valence orbitals. Remember that for linear molecules, the simpler point group D2H can be used. As before, the CO2 molecule is split into two parts, a central carbon atom and an outer group formed from the two oxygen atoms. The group orbitals for the outer oxygen group are the same as those previously considered for bifluoride, but now have four carbon atomic orbitals to consider. It is time now to consider the symmetry of these atomic orbitals. The 1s of the carbon has two potential orbitals to interact with, the oxygen 2s or the 2pz group orbitals. The carbon 2pz can potentially interact with the difference of the oxygen 2s or the sum of the 2pz orbitals. There are also pairs for the b2u and the b3u carbon atomic orbitals. This leaves at least two non-bonding orbitals from symmetry considerations. Thus, in theory, all of the central atom's orbitals can interact with the outer orbitals. But of course, before constructing the molecular orbital diagram, the orbital energies must be considered. It can be seen that oxygen, 2s, will not interact well with the carbon 2s as it is too low in energy, but the carbon 2s and 2p will interact with the oxygen 2p because of their similar energies. Now that the relative atomic orbital energies are known, the molecular orbital diagram can be assembled. As before, we have the central atom carbon on the left and the outer group orbitals of the two oxygens on the right. The sigma bonding molecular orbitals of CO2 can then be drawn by combining atomic orbitals of appropriate symmetry. The 2s non-bonding orbital is also drawn. We can then apply the symmetry labels which are derived from the symmetries of the atomic orbitals ascending a number from lowest to highest energy. We can then do the same for the pi orbitals whilst graying out the sigma orbitals. Again, the non-bonding orbitals from the oxygen p orbitals are also drawn. Removing the symmetry labels for clarity, the molecular orbitals can then be filled. Up to this point, the group orbitals have been determined using inspection, but this typically only works for simple molecules and the more robust stepwise process should be used for larger molecules. First, we assign a point group descending in symmetry from d infinity h to d2h. Next, we assign the axes. Third, we make the reducible representations for the outer atoms. We then find the irreducible representations from the reducible representations using this equation, which gives us the group orbital symmetries. From the rigorous approach, we were able to obtain the exact same group symmetries as by inspection. We then get the central atom orbitals either from the character table or by doing the same approach as for the group orbitals. Then we're able to form the 
molecular orbital diagram for carbon dioxide in the same way as we did previously. Now we consider our first nonlinear molecule. Water has a bent geometry with the C2V point group. First, as usual, the point group is assigned. Water belongs to the C2V point group. Next, the axes that need to be assigned. The principal axis of rotation will be the Z axis. The Zx plane is a molecular plane and the Y axis is perpendicular to the molecular plane. Next, using the character table for C2V, the reducible representation for the outer group orbitals can be determined. Under the E operation, there is no change. For C2, then, both move. For a reflection in the mirror plane, there is no change, giving 2, but in the YZ plane, they do change, giving 0. This can then be reduced to give the symmetries of the group orbitals as A1 and B1. Using both the character table and our irreducible representations, we can already tell which orbitals will interact with each other. The A1 group orbitals have the same symmetry as the Z axis, meaning that they will interact with the S and PZ atomic orbitals of oxygen. For the B1 group, which has the same symmetry as the X axis, we would expect to see interaction with the oxygen PX orbital. The PY orbital with the B2 symmetry does not have a symmetry matched pair and will most likely be non-bonding. For outer group orbitals, we only have the 1s orbitals of hydrogen. They can either be the sum of the atomic orbitals for A1 or the difference of the atomic orbitals for B1. For oxygen atomic orbitals, the s and pz orbitals have an A1 symmetry as expected from the character table. The px orbital has B1 symmetry and the py orbital has B2 with no symmetry pair and will be non-bonding. The A1 form the group orbitals and oxygen atomic orbitals will form one set of bonding molecular orbitals and the B1 symmetry set will form another bonding orbital. The next step is then to construct the molecular orbital diagram, but first we need to consider relative orbital energies. Water has hydrogen and oxygen atomic orbitals that can interact due to correct symmetry but the 2s of oxygen is too deep in energy to interact. So let's build the molecular orbital diagram for water. The center atom, as usual, goes on the left and the group orbitals on the right. Next, we form the molecular orbitals between the atomic or group orbitals of appropriate symmetry and we label them accordingly with the orbitals formed from the A1 symmetry orbitals being 2a1, 3a1 and 4a1. Remember that the 1a1 is the oxygen 1s and is too low in energy to influence bonding. The 2a1, having symmetry that allows it to interact with the group orbitals, is low in energy and essentially non-bonding. The two sigma bonding orbitals are then formed from the b1 and a1 symmetry sets, with the 2py of oxygen then forming the highest occupied molecular orbital as a non-bonding lone pair. This then gives us the complete molecular orbital picture of water with two lone pairs on the oxygen from the 2a1 and the 1b2 molecular orbitals. Let's check comprehension.